We are joined by podcast host and celebrity interviewer, Josh Smith, author of Great Chat, Seven Lessons for Better Conversations, Deeper Connections and Improved Wellbeing. Also an old friend who I have had been having great chats with on and off since meeting in a festival in the glamping field nine years ago. I worked out, Josh, <laughs> 2015. Um, Josh is a professional conversationalist who can teach us a lot about the art of conversation, having chatted to A-listers including Victoria Beckham and Oprah no less. He says that every conversation we have is an opportunity for self-reflection and self-development, and I could not agree more. As you know, I bring people together. I love people talking and chatting, so I think it helps if we know how to do it. Hello, Josh, my love. Welcome to the Shelf Help Gang, and big congratulations on your book, baby. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. It's so good to see you all. And I'm so excited to be here tonight and to talk to you. And that's just brought back a, a really strong, visceral memory of us having that first great chat in, in festival. I know. And I think it's important to talk about that. It, it's probably our nine year anniversary this month. Um, so first meeting in a field in Dorset. Uh, I was I was at the Mail Online. I think, were you at Grazia? Yeah, there? I was at Grazia and I was... Uh, like very much like a baby in my career at that point I think I was still a fashion assistant so yeah. I was just starting out yeah that's it feels it feels like a million years ago and so oh, much okay. stuff has happened in that nine years well that's why I thought it's good to share it because it's like look at us now doing our own thing right and I think if you just yeah. to us in that field or in, a, in like in a few years time you'll both be like self-help gurus in the making <laughs> like we would have been like what <laughs> honestly if you told me one of my friends the other day who I used to work with Grazi said to me could you imagine telling the us who were fashion assistants who are pre pretty much just living off Chipotle burritos that you would be a self-help book author I would have laughed in her face so <laughs> the fact that it's come that I'm in this position in my career now it's just incredible it's amazing I'm enjoying every single second of it I can tell. And it is amazing because I think how amazing that you can use, we can both use the art of chat, which you've basically made a career out of to help people feel better and to do use it as a way to support people's like mental health mm. and well-being. It's our like favorite thing to do, but also it's so powerful and helpful, isn't it? Yeah. Talking is the most powerful thing of all, I think. Not just talking, but listening. I think we talk a lot, a lot about how great it is to talk, but we don't talk enough about how amazing it is to truly listen to each other as well and to share our stories and go through the steps that I talk about in the book. Um, and I think that if we all made a stronger commitment individually and as a society to share our story more, listen more, we would have a much better, much more understanding society. And I think that that's the crux of the book is that it's great because you're turning great chat right here into a self-development practice to make your life better to build stronger mm -hmm. connections to make your mental health and well-being stronger but also in doing so you're building up people around you too so it's a social ripple effect and I think that's we all need to get back to that place in society where we're coming together more and building communities more like this this is the community right yes it sure is and we do talk a lot actually about active listening like we talk about and we practice it actually when we do our community meetups and that's mm. and that's so yeah it really it really is important because a conversation or a chat is two a two-way street isn't it yeah it's a two-way street and I think a lot of people don't realize that I mean how many times yeah. have we met monologues in our lives who just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, and talk, and talk at us or they or you'll just meet people who will just not ask you a single question they're so or people who just do not listen to you and I think that's the thing a lot of people don't realize that talking is an active, not a passive mm -hmm. process. Building a connection is an active, not a passive process. And I think we need to get back to really focusing on that and really putting the effort in to make our lives better and make the lives of other people better too. Yeah, totally. And I think it's good to know um, what you're teaching in this book is that it's actually a skill that you can practice. Mm. We do yeah. have... We do have, um, I would say we've got quite a lot of introverts in our group. Would you admit, would you say that, guys? Let us know in the chat. Um, quite a lot of introverts and people who might be kind of like socially anxious, socially awkward, or just or just not feel that confident always at kind of doing the great chat and mm. talk. So I think maybe for you and I, it's kind of been, it's, it, it, we've, we've had to do it as part of our job and maybe it comes more naturally. So I think it's great for people to know that there's like, there's literally a strategy if you want to follow it. Like you talk about the sandwich and we'll talk about that in a bit, but it's like how, how, how empowering to know it's something you can get better at if you want to. Yeah, I think that anyone can get better at becoming a better communicator. And I know that personally because 
Um, as I talk about in the beginning of the book, I had a speech impediment when I was younger. It was a real struggle for me to be able to talk and vocalize myself. And then once I overcame that by working with speech therapists, I then went through quite a difficult period in my teenage years where everyone else around me's voice dropped and I did it. And it made me very much a target for homophobic bullies. And it made me lose so much confidence in my voice all over again. I could never, I couldn't listen to my voice back. So to get into this position now, to be doing this as a career is so wild to me. Like if you said to the four-year-old me who had the speech impediment or the teenage me who had the speech impediment um, who was going through the struggle with their voice all over again, that I would be doing this, they wouldn't believe it. So I know that everyone can get better at communicating and I know it's a skill you can hone and get better at because I've done it. And amazingly, it's been such an incredible thing to me because getting better at it has shown me how impactful and how empowering it can be when you are a stronger, more confident communicator. And the thing is, not everyone's going to be a confident communicator every single day. And I think that's what people think too. They think that, oh, you're a confident communicator. Like everyone's going to struggle with parts of communication, their communication skills at some points in their life, be it like opening up about something they're going through. They might be so drained of their social battery, they can't even listen to anyone or take anything out more on. So I think it's a really unifying thing to realize that everyone struggles with conversations at certain points, but there are methods and things you can do to make yourself more empowered, make yourself more confident. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and we're going to talk about social battery tonight because that is a big thing for lots of us. Yeah. Um, and I think also you don't we don't always need to be like um being confident in your great in your chat in your conversation it doesn't mean you need to be a presenter it doesn't mean need to you no, need no, no. To be a great public speaker it's just being able to like connect pro better maybe with people you already know or to meet if you're dating or if you want to meet new friends or whatever it's like being able to kind of put yourself out there and feel confident in that yeah 100 percent. and i think that you know it's this book was born out of this idea that we're living in a digital world now where we spend more and more and more time talking to people in a virtual world. I know we're in a virtual space right now, but this is a bit different. You know, we've got videos, we're facing each other, we're having a great chat, but we're living our lives behind these devices and these phones. And we've really have lost these art conversations. So especially the, the first time I had this idea for this book came out of this chat I had with one of my best friends, Lauren. And she said to me, I'm so sick of being on these dating apps. And meeting these boys and they have this great chat online and then in real life they've got no chat at all and I was like this is so true and that's kind of what started this genesis of the book and where it came from it, it that was what gave me the idea because I was like I know so much about this I've taught myself to become a more confident communicator so I use my experience with amazing psychological research that you'll find in the book that is absolutely mind-blowing facts about how powerful talking and conversation can be to yourself it's on par, you need it for your well-being. on par with eating and sleeping. And that is crazy when you think about that. We are designed to be social animals. And I think there are things that get in the way of that sometimes. We can become more socially anxious. We can come, become, become more socially introverted at different points. But if you turn up and you keep pushing yourself, you will get better at it. And I think that's the thing that you were saying just now is, it, the thing about great chat is it's not about becoming the loudest person in the room it's not about becoming a tv presenter it's not about becoming a podcast host it's about making sure every single time that you are going into a social situation you are turning up and showing up for yourself and for others and sometimes you might get it wrong sometimes you might absolutely excel but that's absolutely fine as long as you're putting in the effort effort is non-negotiable I think in life especially when it comes to communication so if you start making that effort every single day it will completely change your life and there's an amazing study that recently came out that if you are socially anxious and you push yourself every single day to do something to get out there even if it's just like for instance on the first day saying to someone hi how are you like your neighbor or your colleague at work, whoever it might be, someone you come to contact with. If you do that and build up over the course of a week, it's scientifically proven that over a week, you will be more confident in just mm -hmm. a week. Mm -hmm. So when you have, when you know that, it's so incredible that you know that you have the power to change not just your life, but the life of others too. 
Yeah, and it's like pushing yourself a little bit. I've just checked, and mm. there's someone in this call, Shelley. She's actually in California, but she one of her one of her homework bits of homework she gave herself recently when we were talking about confidence was to say hello to someone in the lift at work. And uh, yeah. I don't know if you did it or not, Shelley. You have to let us know in the chat. But it was like because for her that was that's a big deal, and it's like but she understands the importance of like putting itself out there. So that's like it sounds like a small step maybe for some people, but actually, like you say, that's actually going to make a massive difference yeah it makes a massive difference I love that and you just talked about sometimes you'll have a great chat and sometimes you'll get it wrong so before we go through the before we go through the seven lessons let's hit how did you learn these lessons can we talk about some amazing chats you had and feel free to name drop here um and also maybe some that weren't so amazing <laughs> or that would yeah, not, I, that you learned a lot from I think the thing about life is, and this sounds really corny because a lot of people ask me quite often, like, who's your favorite person you've ever interviewed? And I truly believe that every single person you meet in life is a teacher or a lesson to you. You've just got to be willing and willing to have those ears open, your heart open, and to get out there and have those conversations. You never know what you're going to learn. Like, you can learn amazing things from people you agree with, disagree with, you like, you don't like. Everyone can be a teacher or a lesson to you. So I've treated every single conversation that I have with whatever celebrity I'm interviewing in that same way and the lessons that really taught me like the Oprah I talk about this in the book a bit because I remember going to interview Oprah for the first time and I was so nervous about doing it because she's the ultimate interviewer how do you interview the ultimate interviewer and I thought what makes Oprah so special Oprah is always authentically herself you know exactly what you're going to get from the Oprah interview. You know what she stands for. You know how passionate she is. You know how warm she is, how open she is. She is a portable safe space for people. And that's why she gets so much out of people. So when I went to that room, I was like, I'm just going to be me. So mm -hmm. I went in as my, my camp style. And it was amazing. Like she was spending the interview time. And that was such an amazing lesson in life, I think, for everyone is that it's always about putting your authentic self forward. So that's what the book is all about. It's about saying, look at the skills that you've got. You have got something that you can offer someone, be it something you've learned in your life. You have an amazing heart that you might be able to offer someone. And you've just got to make sure you're taking yourself wherever you go. And that's such a massive lesson that I've learned. I learned that as well when I interviewed Hayley Atwell, the actress of Mission Impossible, and she's been loads those amazing things. And she sent me a message after I interviewed her. And that's what she said to me in the message. She said, you take you wherever you go and keep dictating the tone that you want in any single room and it's so right like if you are going into a party and you're nervous to go turn up turn up as yourself don't turn up as someone else have the confidence in yourself to be yourself and then you will connect with people better like authenticity is the greatest magnet the greatest bonding tool we all have and I think if we focus on that rather than trying to be someone else you'll get so much further you'll have so much more confidence I think that's where people tend to struggle quite a lot with great chats is they think they need to be someone else they think they need to be um mm. the loudest person but actually don't you could be the quietest person but you still got something amazing to share yeah so those kind of conversations taught me a lot and the difficult ones I'm not going to name a name with that but um there was one which never saw the light of day um because it was so difficult um on the podcast but that also taught me a massive lesson in the you can't control someone else mm. you can't control their behavior as long as you're as long as you're doing your job like I've been saying as long as you're turning up doing your thing and you're a good person that's all that's all so some people just don't won't get you or it won't be or you won't be vibing or and that's yeah that's not necessarily it's not about you it's about it's a that's a then thing yeah well you just don't know what someone else is going through right you never yeah. know what someone else is going through in life and I think that you can, as long as you, I always live by one rule, which is as long as you turn up and you're a good person, if someone reacts to you badly, you know that you put the effort in, you know you've shown up, then it's 99.9% .9 on them. And that's absolutely fine because you can't control people, right? You can't control them. And, you know, there's the first lesson in the book is all about treating conversation like a sandwich. And I know we're going to come on to that in a minute, but you can't control... <laughs> how someone else is going to react to your sandwich <laughs> as yeah. long as you've built that sandwich with love and kindness and good intent then top marks yes um just before we go on to the sandwich then and the lessons the signature shelf help question which I love to ask how's your relationship with yourself right now 
Uh, my relationship with myself is actually probably the best it's been in forever, actually. I had I had this, I went through quite a tough time at the beginning of this year and I had quite a big epiphany that I lost a lot of joy for my life. Like I, I have, I've always been someone who loves life. I love being around people. I literally love living. I know that sounds so extreme, but I just do. And I kind of lost that last year. And I just realized that I was just turning up to things and just going along with the flow and not actually giving myself over in the right ways. And I really had a word for myself and really checked in. I was like, I've lost this joy for my life and I need to get it back. And I've been really working on that over the last six months. And I can say now that the joy is completely back, I feel so much joy in my life again. And there was one thing my boyfriend actually said to me on the day of our book, uh, of the book launch, our book launch, my book launch, um, my book launch, where he said to me, I was really stressed about the event. And he just said to me, there's no point doing this unless you can enjoy it. And I was like, it's such simple, <laughs> very simple advice, but it was almost like magic advice to me. Because I was like, yeah, I do all these amazing things all the time, but I stress so much about them. Mm -hmm. I get myself so panicked into a frenzy sometimes that I forget to do the thing that's the most important thing, and that's enjoy it. And ever since then, that was only just over a month ago, that completely changed my the way I look at myself and my relationship with myself. I just go into everything trying to enjoy it instead of overly analyzing it, reading into things and that's been really amazing for me. And last week I did a, my first ever solo holiday, like on my own for four days. I know that sounds like that's not a long time at all, but for me, that was like a century. <laughs> um, and it was amazing because I just took some time out to, you know, I know we're going to talk about your social batteries, but I was pretty worn down after um, launching the book, which has been the most amazing experience. Like I was saying before, like I, I've enjoyed every single living second of it. And I'm just so thankful I can say that and but it definitely took a lot out of me at the same time because you're offering so much of yourself up and as I get older I realize how much I offer up to other people so in order to offer up I can't be I can't be pouring in from an, an empty cup can I so I have to re that and actually taking those four days on my own with the only person I spoke to was the pool guy at this villa where I was staying and um, he was very French and barely spoke English was <laughs> was actually really amazing and a bit off brand when we're talking about great chat but it is actually on brand because you need to take that time out sometimes soon or do you can turn up and be the best version of yourself. Yeah, I think- Did I answer your question? Joyful. The relationship with South is great. And joyful. Yeah, and joyful. The joy is here. The joy is here. I think you'd call that a social blackout. That's what Josh Smith would call that, what you just did. Yeah, it's a social blackout. And you blackout. need it. You need it. To you do need a social blackout. To recharge for the rest of it. And I'm just going to tell you that Shelley says that she's now, um, her lift chats have now become effortless because she did, she's doing it. So that's great. <laughs> yes, Shelley. I love to hear it. My Bunch boyfriend has an absolute phobia of talking in lifts. So, because I just talk anywhere and everywhere. And sometimes we get into a lift and he, I'm talking to him. And he's like, oh my God, what are you doing? You need to stop right now. Like, like, the, the facial expression is like, shut yeah. up. I'm talking. Oh yeah, a lift chat is a great chat. <laughs> right then, we're going to talk about your lessons. So we've got seven lessons. We're going to do try and yes. do top line so that we have time to do our exercise as well. So I will um, try and keep you on, <laughs> on timing. Uh, shall I read out the headlines and then you talk to me about what they're each about? Yes, great idea. Yeah. Okay. And guys, if you have any questions as we go, let us know in, in the chat. Um, lesson one, think of a conversation like a great sandwich. Yes. So this idea was born out of the fact that I think a lot of people think that there's no rhyme or reason to why you form a connection with someone but actually there is it's not a magic formula it's not just it happens but it happens for specific reasons and so I like to think of every great conversation like a great sandwich so fundamentally when you're picking your sandwich for lunch you're picking it because of the filling right you want that ch chicken mayo you want that tuna pasta tuna pasta I don't know if you want tuna pasta sandwich you might do whatever you're feeling <laughs> you it's your do. choice <laughs> yeah tuna mayo um that's the reason why you're picking the sandwich right but if you don't have the two slices of bread either side of it it's not a sandwich it's just like a bit of filling on a plate and no one really wants that when you come to a conversation most of the time while you're entering into that conversation is you're entering into the filling so that might be the hot gossip 
That might be the DMC of your best friend. That might be sharing something that's really important to you. That might be um, encouraging your friend to open up about things that are troubling them. Whatever it might be, that's the feeling. But you're not going to be able to have a great conversation unless you focus on the other two parts of that chat. So you have the first slice, which is like the warm hellos, the how are you's. The how are you is one of the most important questions you could ever ask anyone in your entire life. And I say in the book that the most important question we could ask is how are you really? Because that next that next word really encourages people to actually check in with themselves. I think that's really important. Um, and then that's all about the first slice is about building first impressions because you build a first impression of someone within four seconds of meeting them, which is mind blowing. Mm. Like and we are more and more time poor. So we are going into these conversations sometimes thinking, I'm so busy, I'm so busy. I don't have time for this. So if someone is someone is not giving you a great impression from the word go, you're gonna be like, see ya, I'm not interested in this conversation. You're not even gonna get to the feeling. And then it's all about then working on the small talk. Um, so how to make small talk more interesting. So try to get away from the weather and slice up a little bit more. And then you can then get to the feeling. So then that's the to and throwing. That's the things I was just talking about. And then the final, the final slice is the the conclusion. And I think a lot of people, if you're nervous about communicating, and I think this is pretty much proven from all the conversations I have with people, so many people who are socially anxious <laughs> tend to get so nervous about talking because they're so scared about how they're going to get out of it. I think so many people can relate to that. I've been in conversations before. I've been like, oh my god, I don't have this conversation. I don't know how I'm going to get out of it. So that's about having a great. <laughs> and you're, while you're plan. in it. You're like thinking. Yeah, well, I'm in it. I'm like, oh my God, how am I going to get out of this conversation? I'm so deep and I need to get out of it. So it's about making sure you have a predetermined exit plan. So it's, but making sure it's it's building a lasting impression. So you want the first impression, the middle and the lasting impression. And the lasting impression is saying things like, it's been really like, for instance, if you're at a party and you're talking to someone or you're a networking event and, you know, times are ticking and you know, you want to wrap this up and you can kind of sense they want to wrap the two, just say to them something like, it's been really amazing talking with you or chatting with you, not to you, with you, because it's a two-way street. It's a team yeah, effort. Like it. And and I really loved hearing about X, Y, or Z that you just talked about. And I'm really going to take an amazing lesson away from that. And if you want to see them again, you'll be like, oh my God, let's keep in touch. This is how we're going to do it. So it's about looking, and I think if you are socially anxious, you are an introverted person, it can really help if you start thinking about a conversation like a sandwich, because mm -hmm. it's a framework you can lean on at any point. You can remember the structure, you know exactly the steps you need to get through, and all of a sudden, it feels so much less overwhelming than thinking about this huge conversation with all the different possibilities that could happen. Um, and so that's the first step. Love it. I love that. I love that analogy. Brilliant. And, and also it seems like you're starting and you're finishing with like warm you said the word I think a few days like that yeah. kind of like because then it it, it may it, it gives people a nice feeling to take away and it also makes you feel better doesn't it that kind of yeah exactly connection. yeah and also especially in part of that as well as it's all about body language too like if you have open warm body language I called your body language like the wrapping paper of um of your conversation because if you're presenting warm open body language people are going to be more attracted to you they're going to you're going to see more socially attracted to them and then if someone else is nervous they will replicate it and if you're unconfident if you start pulling your shoulders back and then literally sitting upright and being open your body will kick in and you'll be like oh god i'm actually more confident to do this too yeah, sure. We've talked about power posing, actually, and stuff like that in the in the community. So it's all about like, yeah, as soon as you do sit up taller, you feel you do feel more yeah. and confident. OK, lesson two, yeah. ask the question. Yeah, so questions are so imperative and I think they are wildly overlooked in our society today. I know some friends, for instance, who I've been in situations with who've never asked me a single question. <laughs> and you're like, wow the important thing about great chat is you need to be interesting and interested and yeah. I think that people neglect the interested bit so questions are scientifically proven to make you more likable so if you want to get to know someone ask them questions make them interesting ones so instead of very entry-level chat I'm going in with here but you know how most of the time if you were going to meet someone you'd be like what have you been up to lately and most of the time someone's been replying to that it's either saying two classic answers, I've been really busy, or they're going to say, not a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's like... And you're yeah. like, great, there's not a lot I can take from that. But if you say instead something like, 
what is the most exciting thing that's happened to you recently? They're going to go, oh my God, I actually cannot give my default answer to this. I'm actually going to have to think about it and you're going to get so much more out of them and you're going to start an even more incredible conversation. So in this, in that lesson, it talks you through the different types of questions you could ask, um, the different categories of questions, there's about seven different types of questions you can ask, like clarifying questions, um, right up to probing questions. And it's all about finding, so at the end of each lesson is a chatter box. So it's like an activity that you need to do to get yourself out there and push yourself out there more. And um, that one ends up, uh, that the chatter box for that lesson is all about finding your toolbox of questions. Because mm -hmm. I go into every single conversation I have in my life with about, say, 15 different questions in the back of my mind that I know I can lean on if I'm really desperate. So if you're if you're nervous, perfect. Think of find your five questions you know are gonna, you know, make someone more excited to talk to you or make them more interesting. Find those five questions, take them wherever you go, and you'll be racing. Yeah. And do you do that even with for non-interviews, like non-work yeah. conversations? So they're always just yeah. there, ready. Like it's yeah. like a glass and a love tool. Yeah. Well, before I met my boyfriend, I was quite a prolific dater, shall I say. So I uh, I kind of realized that you had to like literally show up to these things with quite a lot of um, questions in your back pocket. So, yes, I do that. The tried, and tested, the tried and tested technique. It's tried and tested, trust me. And even with friends, you know, sometimes you friends can be you know, if they're going through something or they're just not turning up and they're just in a bit of a mood, like it can be quite hard work sometimes, right? We all know that. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, sometimes it's quite handy to have those in the back of your back of your head too. Yeah, I do do this actually. Um, I ask, uh, what so what, what's happening this week for you? Or um, what did you do at the weekend? Or so, you know, it's very like a specific time because then people do go mm. up and they actually think about stuff rather than the generic, like you say, what's going on. Yeah. Um, lesson three, listen twice as much as you talk. We kind of talked about that a little bit already, but let's let's go into that. Yeah, so that's all about becoming an active listener. And being an active listener, um, I talk you through the different steps of becoming an active listener and how you can do it. So the best way I think to show you care about someone in life is to listen to them. Not just listen to them, but truly listen to them. And I think that we've got into a habit of thinking that listening is a passive but not an active process and it's completely active you need to be giving yourself over to it without mm -hmm. distraction and one of the key things that is distracting us and stopping us from listening is this I the phone. Gonna say that. <laughs> so I call it a practice called neglecting so it's when you pick up your phone when someone's talking to you and then you're neglecting that conversation what do you if call that it? phone I call it moglecting. 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 So <laughs> mobile neglecting. Nice, that, that just happens all the time, all over the place. Yes, all the time. It's the enemy of great chat, is the phone. Yes. So <laughs> you need to get that phone out of your way. Like, even if you think about it this way, if you are having dinner with your friend and their phone is turned over, that's still saying, that's still yeah. saying this phone is more important than what's happening in front of me. Mm -hmm. So that is the enemy of great chat. We need to get rid of that. That's all part of becoming an active listener. It's also about making sure that you are not interrupting. It's not about offering unsolicited advice. It's about really cleaning out your mind as well. I call it like um, spring cleaning on your mind before you go into a conversation with someone. Because if you're distracted and you're thinking about your to-do list, like the 25 things you need to get through today, and this comfort while you're talking to someone, you're not going to be really listening to what they're saying. So if they're saying, you know, if they say, you ask how they are and they say, oh, yeah, I'm doing all right, thanks. And they're, they're actually sounding a bit sad. And you've already moved on to the next thing because you're not really listening. You're not really checking in with them. There's, that's that's the spark of conversation you completely miss. Mm -hmm. So um, it's about making sure that you're sprinkling your mind, so you're completely present and then turning listening into a mindful practice. Listening is so good for you. Like if you are feel if you're feeling anxious about anything and you just focus on the person in front of you and what they're saying, all of your worries and fears you brought into that conversation kind of dissipate and you will go away feeling so much better about yourself and your mind and feeling like you have a clearer mind. So mm -hmm. that chapter is all about becoming an active listener, turning it into mindful practice and really treating it like it's a well-being practice. 
Yeah, that's lovely. I've never thought about it like that, but that's actually, you're right. Yeah. You're, out, you're out, even though you are listening, you're out of your head and you're kind of like mm. stories and to do's and like you say, all that kind of stuff. And then you're at, it's like when you're reading a great story or watching a great film or painting or walking or whatever it is, when you're in it, you're not thinking about or stressing about all the other stuff. Brilliant. Yeah. That's cool. I love the I, I love the sound of this one. And I think you and I have had some chats in this. The club toilet <laughs> the pool. <laughs> yes. So um everyone in life needs a safe space to retreat to. We all need it. That safe space looks different for every single person in this room right now and every single other person you know. But I think one of the ultimate safe spaces is the club toilet at 2am. Now, why you might think that is because every filter has been dropped. You will meet a girl that you've never met before in your whole life and she might be crying about some good for nothing man and you're literally giving her the best life advice ever saying, you don't need that man, you're beautiful, you're amazing. Oh my God, you're incredible. You might be opening up to your friend in a new way that you haven't done before. You might be having a chat with your rhino like men like to do because they don't have to keep eye contact so they might open up a little bit more. It is a hotbed for social activity and for great conversations. And that's because it is a safe space. It's literally a retreat from the club. It's literally a retreat from the outside world. Like everyone's left their lives the night they're there, they're having a great time. And I think that we need to turn every space we go into into a club toilet space, not including the music and maybe the alcohol, but like treating it like that. So um, having more unfiltered conversations and encouraging people to open up more, creating safe spaces. So I talked you through in that chapter how to create this club toilet principle in real life, no matter what scenario you're in, because everyone does need a safe space to retreat to in life. Love that, especially if you're talking about um important things like or big mm. things, I suppose. like when you talk about actually we talked about this in the club as well like sometimes really important conversations happen in the car and that's because you're in like yes. a main space and you're not and you're not act, actually not directly looking at each other so that's where you can drop like a big bomb almost and then like yeah. you've done it to kids or people that are talking about new boyfriends or all that kind of stuff it's like there's no there's not really any escape but equally you're together and you're and yeah. it's not too confrontational so it's that that feels like a safe space yeah, it's so true. And I mean, in the last session, I talk a lot about create, uh, making sure you maintain eye contact with people because it's so important. There's no quicker way to show you're listening to someone than looking at them straight, your whole body like locked into them. Yeah. But sometimes in life, if you want to talk about difficult things, doing it on a walk or like you're saying in a car. Like, I mean, I came up to my mom in a car. So <laughs> that's a prime example of it. Yeah. I was like, you do know I'm gay, right? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, gay. Hey, um, she was like, back, back. She was literally dropping me at uni for um for like one of my holidays. So I was like, bye. Like, <laughs> yeah. So it does that does really help sometimes as well. Yeah, for big news. Okay, lesson five: sharing is caring. Um. Yes. So sharing is caring. So the most important thing we can do for each other is to share our stories authentically and share ourselves authentically. And it's that lesson is all about really practicing this idea of honesty sharing and that's about sharing with the right people at the right time for you because you know we talk a lot about how it's good to talk but I would argue if you're just talking for the sake of it and to the wrong people it's not going to help you it's not going to help solve those problems it's not going to make you feel better it's not going to make you feel more empowered so that lesson is all about looking at sharing how you can become a better sharer and then also looking at what to do when someone else is sharing with you. So what not to say and what to say. For instance, if someone's opening up to you and they say, oh, I'm actually really struggling at the moment. I'm feeling really sad. And you go, we well, don't look sad. Like, you look fine. You look happy on Instagram. You look, oh, my God, like you're having this great life. That's that's not helpful. Mm. Like, you just don't, you never know what's going on in someone's psyche at any given point. So it's all, that lesson is all about how powerful sharing can be, not just for ourselves, but for other people. Like if you start sharing yourself more authentically and opening up more about the things going on in your life, it has a social ripple effect and it will encourage other people to open up too. Like you think about every great stigma that's existed in our society from the beginning of time, for instance, HIV and AIDS, mental health, the way that the stigma has been broken down around those things is by people actively sharing and honestly, share, honestly sharing about their experiences. Yeah. And I think that if we take that energy with us in whatever sphere of life you're in, it will help so many other people around you, not just yourself too. 
yeah and it's and you don't need to be sharing deeply with every single person that you meet it's like it's yeah it's kind of choosing the people to share with I suppose as well yeah I mean Rich has just said this amazing thing in here saying sharing is caring but caring about your sharing is important mm -hmm. too it's so that is so great wish that line was in the book Richard <laughs> <laughs> you can that that. So good. <laughs> I, I, I'll bring I'll borrow that one for the paperback if you don't mind um but like oh, it's so true like you need to care about how you're sharing and mm. to really look after and nurture the way you're sharing with others yeah love it um lesson six the power of knowing your social battery and boundaries well we'll talk about that yes. we'll going to the exercise of that in a bit so let's we're going to skip that one for now so lesson seven yeah get awkward how to embrace difficult conversations yeah so this is a big one isn't it I think yeah. so many people feel very nervous about having certain different types of conversations and that looks different for every single person you might feel nervous about talking to someone about your political viewpoints you also might feel nervous about sharing something with your partner that you need to address with them or with your friend for instance so it's all about teach you that lesson is all about teaching you to not just be fearful of awkward conversations or difficult conversations but to embrace them like we can't we need difficult conversations in our lives it boosts our it boosts our well-being I know that sounds crazy but you do need them we need to work through some element of conflict in our lives to establish our identity it's a proven fact that's why you argue with your parents quite a lot when you're a teenager because you're establishing yourself away from them that's mm -hmm. why it's happening like there's so much research that proves that point and as we go through life we kind of do need a bit of a push in the throw we need to like have debates with people and I think the problem is that now in our society and this is something I talk about in the book quite a lot is we live in a time of algorithms right so you'll go on to Twitter Facebook whatever social platform you will use and you'll be served the extreme viewpoint either side left right hardly anything that's actually in the middle so if you're, because that's what social media platforms are doing, they want to keep you engaged. And I think what's happening now in our society is we're treating our social lives like algorithms that we can't, so many people can't bear to be around people who disagree with them or have different viewpoints to them. Like I remember a time when, and this makes me sound, I, I'm not trying to be like, oh, back in the day. But I do remember times where you'd be able to have friends with people who have different opinions to you and still have healthy discussions with them. But we also live in a time of really heavy, heavily, filtered content right so you're seeing these filtered images online and you're filtering your truth too because you're nervous about how someone's going to react but the only way we're going to get forward in life and so many of the problems we have in our society today would be solved by other people from different sides coming together and actually having conversation and actually truly listening to each other so that is what this that lesson is all about it's all about teaching everyone to embrace conversation so that we can find a way forward or you can find a way forward or a solution that you need or want. Yeah, that's brilliant. Because I think there's loads of us that who in in this community, especially like we are, we're doing the work. Quite often we think the other people in our life should be the ones doing the work, but they're not. So it's up to us to kind of like be, lead by example. But then but then you will yeah. come against people who are, I don't know, casually being racist or something like that. And it's like, mm -hmm. how do you start those conversations of I, I don't agree with what you're saying and this is why without it without it turning yeah. into a fight and being then able to kind of not necessarily change their mind or but to give them a different perspective yeah 100 percent, and I think that that's a really difficult thing to do because if you're passionate about something for instance I'm very passionate about trans rights and I find it very hard to listen to someone who doesn't want to listen to that but I feel like my job as an ally to the trans community is to call that stuff out when I see it calmly, tell them why it's offensive. And if they can't then take that on board, that's down to them. But you can be gently doing the work wherever you are. Every, every single person in life has a platform, right? Whether you have one follower or one million followers, everyone has a platform and you can change people's lives around you. I mean, I've had so many amazing discussions with my parents. They're a completely different generation to me. They never expected to have a gay child. Honestly, we've had very frank discussions about that. But like, it's you, you how they went to know when they've never been, when they've never been um, able to be part of this community. And now my mum is like such an amazing ally to my community because of the conversations we've had. And that makes her a better person. It makes me a better person. And that is our job as individuals, I think, is to, 
it's not about shouting people down because yes, mm-hmm. some people are toxic, right? And there's a whole thing about how to deal with toxic listeners in the book and the different categories of toxic listeners there are. Mm-hmm. But if you you can change people's lives and outlooks just by having very general conversations with them. Mm, yeah, no, I love that. There's no point shouting. That's not going to help. That's mm-hmm. not going to help. But equally, yeah, I love that. Everyone's got a platform as well. So be doing the work as gen- gently and persuasively as possible. Um, yeah. okay, let's talk about um, knowing your social battery and boundaries. And yes. I, and I like to, so we'll talk a little bit about the idea of this. Very relevant to you right now, coming back off a, what was it, a six-day <laughs> trip in Ibiza, for Matera. <laughs> 10 days guys I mean it was it was honestly <laughs> like I was actually thinking it was one of the greatest sandwiches ever because it was literally like a stag do joint gay stag do then four days on my own and then a three day 40th so I've literally done like I did the well-being bit in the middle which I'm not sure is the best idea but hey it <laughs> but was you a did stunning it all. sandwich nonetheless um, did it so, all so how would you, so how's you, Josh how's your social battery tonight then on a scale of one to ten how is it how is it and everyone else you can share in the chat how is yours on a, this Monday after the weekend mine is actually quite high because I was so excited to do this so mm-hmm. I and also I get so much energy from having conversations so I'm gonna have the most energy I've had all day after I finish this and as I've gone up my battery's gone like blah, 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 blah. Yeah. so I would say my social battery is quite it's quite good at the moment yeah, brilliant. Tomorrow it might be, it might crash. Yeah, bit. tomorrow it you're might crash. It. Yeah, yeah. But it's I love so that. important. Marie says you're currently charging. Yeah, literally. I'm, I'm literally charging. My laptop's <laughs> charging, I'm charging. <laughs> <laughs> but a few people on the low end. Yeah, and I think that's a no- that's normal, isn't it, for like a Monday, I suppose, for a lot of people, your social battery, you've kind of like, you've done your thing at the weekend and Monday is like, we love Mondays because we get to kind of see each other on here, but when it's like an author event it's quite passive for people I suppose so they can kind of like just be interacting without it being too asking too much of you you do talk a lot about kind of understanding your understanding your how how much battery you have and kind of conserving it Mm -hmm. and only and using it on the right people um and so boundaries is part of this isn't it as well yeah so I think every single person has a social bound uh social battery every single person sorry I start again Every single person has a social battery and we all need to check in with our social battery pretty much every day. So I do this every single day when I wake up, I ask myself, how am I today? How much energy do I have? So then I look at what I've got coming up and I know what I need to conserve my energy for. So if I'm say operating at 60% and I know I've got to do a big interview that day, I know pretty much all my energy is going to have to go into that. So mm-hmm. maybe I'm not then going to go out and have drinks with my friends that night, or I know that I'm not going to go out and have drinks with my friends the night before. So it's all about starting to manage yourself so you can turn up for the things that are important to you. Mm-hmm. Not just turn up, but show up. And that's so important. And I know that a lot of people like to identify as introverts and extroverts. And this is something I talk about in the book. But I don't necessarily believe in identifying with that binary so much. I think that what we need to do is to look at ourselves as individuals and what our social battery is rather than identifying as an introvert or an extrovert. Because I think sometimes you can, if you're extroverted, you can be expected to behave in a certain way. And I, a lot of people would expect me to be an extrovert. And that's been quite a difficult thing at different times where people expect me to be like the life and soul of the party when I can't do that. And Mm -hmm. I think sometimes when you're an introvert, you can use that almost like as a safety blanket to be like, oh, I'm not actually going to I'm not going to push myself out to do this because I'm an introvert. And actually, if you look at yourself, there's every single person will have extroverted or introverted needs at different points in their their life. It's true. Mm -hmm. So you might feel extroverted with this person or introverted with that person. So it's about looking yourself as an individual. And that's why I think it's important to look at your social battery. Because then once you can look after your social battery, you then can, can, you then have the energy to build your social boundaries. And then you have the, then you have the, like then you have the energy to go out there and have the great conversations, push yourself out there to go talk to a stranger you've never spoken to before, to go on that date and woo that person, to go into that office and demand that pay rise that you're you're in need of, babes, because you're so worth it. You know, like that's that's what's so important about checking your social battery so that you can then show up for yourself and others. Yeah, because I suppose all of everything that we've been talking about we're not expecting you're not expecting people to have these kind of conversations with every single person they meet no so it's kind of it's 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 identifying who's important what's important and yeah. like you say, i love that showing up 
not just did you say not turning up showing not just showing up showing up yeah yeah I love that. so I quote Sarah Knight quite a lot I don't know if you know her she writes lots of sweary self-help books but she always says your time your energy um and your money is finite so don't don't so don't don't, don't just fritter it away because it runs out like these are yeah. the, you know, um they kind of so if you're saying yes to everything or if you're doing then you the, the, the important things you're not going to have the energy for it's so true and also sometimes if you're really depleted if you look at your life and you're realizing you're not being around the people that energize you and lift you up that's a bad situation to be in that's then you need to you know book some time in with them so that you can they can help fill up your battery more and also if you are with a friend for instance like I think about this quite a lot being in my relationship with Tom because he's like completely my teammate I think okay if you've got 50% today and I've got 50% today we're making 100% together but if like your for instance is coming home you've only got 20% and I know we've got to go do this thing together I'll put in an extra 80% and you'll be able to do those things if you start looking after social battery and doing the things that work for you so it's all about identifying what works for you what charges you what your chat charging stations are and that's mm-hmm. also about like if you're in a if you're in a situation for instance like you're at a party and you're really exhausted and you're like oh my god I can't do this take yourself to the bathroom and just have 10 minutes on your own and then you'll feel yourself coming back alive again I do that all the time if <laughs> I've literally gone around to, yeah if I've gone to a party and I've been talking to those people for like two hours I'd be like right gonna go to the bathroom now and she's just gonna sit on the toilet for like literally not do anything and I'll literally just be like and just like take some moment for myself and then I'm ready to go again someone's just said actually my my social back social battery is totally flat from work I'm working on an escape plan though <laughs> so yeah different loads of different levels 10 minute power charge yeah, yeah. So basically just hiding in the loo for 10 minutes and having a breather I love it so let's do let's talk about the tier system then because this is yes this is all about um working out who not deserves that's probably the wrong word but who you should be giving your energy to and yeah um and who you get energy from I suppose I can't when I was um, when I was reading it and thinking about it I was like oh it's quite harsh like putting your friends and colleagues and acquaintances into tears but then I suppose like you say it's important because like the important stuff it doesn't just happen by accident like you have to plan mm. like this weekend I've seen so many really good friends but all of those things most of those things were, were planned months ago and it's like yeah. when you get to get together with these people you're like yeah I'm, I know why you're in my life and I feel like I feel I had the busiest weekend I've had for a long time I feel great though because it's all really important people but it's like yes. you don't make the time on purpose to see those people life just gets in the way yeah and I think the thing about the tier system, do you know what? I was really nervous about my friends reading it. Because I was like, they're going to be like, I'm going to tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, so uh, yeah, I was worried it was going to come across as a bit harsh, but it's not because you need to look after yourself to turn up for other people and to be there for the people who matter to you in your life. So the tier system is basically looking at like who you're surrounding yourself with and how they make you feel on a day-to-day basis, month-to-month basis after you see them. And I like to think of the people you surround yourself with, like your diet. If you are eating, if you are eating McDonald's every single day, I mean, I would if I could, but if you're eating McDonald's every day, you're eating fast food all the time, you're not gonna feel great, right? Your diet is on the floor. Mm-hmm. If you are eating, you know, your five a day, you're treating yourself every so often, you're gonna feel a lot better about yourself. And if, if you are surrounding yourself with people who are, you know, the equivalent of junk food, who are draining you, who are sucking your energy out of you, who are making you feel bad about yourself, you're going to feel bad about yourself. But if you're with people who fuel you, who energize you, who make you feel like they're like the world's vitamins, then you're going to feel a little better about yourself. So it's about going through your friends and the people in your life and working out what tier they're going to. So I have it into four different tiers. Um, tier one is the people who you would drop everything for and they, you know, they would do the same for you. And yeah. then you have tier two, which is Hang on, to I'm serve just gonna the people. Tell, say, I'm just going to let people say to people, if they wanted to do this at home, they could kind of start scribbling down in the list. Um, like, and then they can take it away and do it and kind of finish it afterwards. But yeah, let's like, so let's get people, this is your homework, everyone. <laughs> right down the this tiers. is the homework right down the tiers yeah, so- and then go through who you're talking to and stuff on your phone and things like that and then work out where people are yeah it's okay. honestly life-changing I promise okay. 
So tier one, the people you know would drop everything for and they would do the same for you. Tier two is this is the tier reserved for people who would turn up for you if it was convenient for you and convenient for them and you know they feel the same way. So there's quite a lot of people we have in our lives like that. And then tier three is your acquaintances. So these are people who are great to catch up with, but you know, for instance, they wouldn't be invited to your wedding. So definitely don't put yourself out there to go to theirs or you wouldn't have a one-on-one -on -one dinner with them. They're just kind of the people that flit and flit out of your life. And tier four are, and this is so true, there are fountains and drains in life. Fountains are people who gloriously give more to our lives and the drainers just drain time and energy from us. So the drainers belong in tier four. And I think what's really important about this tier system is to check in with yourself every so often about where people are at in your life. Because, you know, it's quite healthy to actually grow outgrow friendships. And so, but also if you if you notice one of your best friends is falling further and down the list because you're not putting enough effort in or they're not putting enough effort in, yeah. it's that's the time to be like, oh my God, okay, I haven't seen Kenny who's in tier one, who used to be in tier one and now he's ended up in tier three because I haven't spent enough time with him. But yeah, I know he's the most amazing person. So that is what the tier system is all about. Even if it sounds harsh, sometimes you have to do the harsh things for yourself. Yeah, and it's like, and I think we don't really realise, we probably don't, until you take time to actually go to think about this, like, and like kind of take time out from life, quite often the tier fourers might be taking more time than anyone because they're just, they're just pulling, pulling, pulling. And so exactly without realising, like you say, without realising it, you're not feeling good because the people who actually fill you up and give you joy aren't, or don't have space in your life. And that's yeah. not because you don't, that's not because you're, you don't want them to be there it's just that you haven't got the energy or the time for them so it's really good to do yeah. an activity like this and it's and it's private you don't need to share it everybody so it's like no one needs to know unless you write a book about the tier system and then, <laughs> then you to know. and you have to put them in there thank god i didn't have to put the examples in it yeah <laughs> you didn't have to do no, that it's so true like if you're surrounding yourself with drainers you're not going to be fulfilled so if you're spending so much time with the tier four people then you need to click yourself out of that. But you sometimes just don't realise. You don't realise yeah. until... It's like anything in life, isn't it? You can add more and more and more and more, more things to your life. Like, and then all of a sudden you turn around, you're like, why am I so stressed? Why have I done this to myself? Because you mm -hmm. don't realise it's all about checking in with yourself, isn't it? Yeah, sure. And sometimes, like, being realistic, there will be people who, um, like, I'm thinking about family or, like, friends. Like, everyone goes through stuff. We all go through stuff. And I suppose good friends... Yeah you'll be there for them when they're not having the best time as well. So it's like, I suppose it's, 100%. it's understanding that if, for instance, I don't know, your your sister is a big drain on you at the moment, but she's your sister. It's like, it's putting boundaries in place, isn't it, around that relationship. So it's not kind yes. of taking over everything. And you talk quite a lot about boundaries as well. Yeah, that's such an important thing to do because you just can't... <laughs> the thing is with friendships are they're going to ebb and flow throughout your whole life, right? And sometimes you have friends for different chapters of your life. And that's amazing. That's great. But some of those people are, should be and could be long life friends to you. Mm. And they're going to go through so many different things in their life. So you need to be making sure you're looking after your social battery and creating social boundaries around them at different times in order for you to be a better friend to them. And like, that's really important. Like exactly what you just said. Like, it's just making sure you're, being there for them as best as you possibly can yeah sure um any insights anybody from your uh list so far the tier system let us know in the chat and also if you have any questions you've got a few minutes left um but just before we go josh thank you so much for sharing all of that it's brilliant so much to take oh away. my god thank you for having me i've um, literally loved it I know I, I'm the same as you you know I think like because I'm an extrovert as well I, I get energy from people and I've worked out now that I'm doing this whole sober thing it's like the reason I'd never want the party to end is just because I want to don't want I want to hang out with people for as long as possible so I've got I'm yeah. just gonna have to work out ways to do that that are more healthy in my life um so that's like a learning from that but then but this book the Celestine Prophecy is our um book of the moment in the book club and this book talks about it's very spiritual it's like 30 years old and it's all about lessons and it talks about um everyone you meet has a message for you everyone who crosses your path in like an oh my god path, which is exactly what you said earlier which i think yeah. is so interesting so if you give if you can if you give them the energy and the time to see it 
anyone like that who kind of really crosses your path has a message for you in some ways. And I thought that's interesting. Um, so I want to know as well, how would you describe your spiritual health? That's a really good question because I've been talking a lot about spirituality recently and I had, it's going to sound absolutely, it's not going to sound crazy. I feel like I'm in safe space, but I'll just tell it. You are, I had this you are call, safe space. Yeah, I, yeah I'm safe space. I had this um, call, I went to go see this amazing person called Emma Lucy Knowles. I'm not sure if you know who she is, but she is a crystal manifesting person and she does a lot of healing workshops, right? I went to this healing workshop I wasn't really sure if I was going to believe in it and then I went and it was one of the most revelatory things ever and she does a lot of like past life stuff and she told me that I was a male witch in an all-female coven and that is why I'm so attracted to female energy in my life and that's why I'm so fearful of failure because I'm so used to things being taken away from me and I was like, oh my God. And literally two days before that, I had written down on my notes, and there's no way she would know this. I, I realized why I was so fearful of failure after thinking about it for a while. And it was because I was so fearful of things being taken away from me. And I was like, whoa. And then wow. ever since then, I'm like, I feel like I've connected myself more. I feel more spiritually aligned with myself. And she taught me loads of amazing lessons from that session about stepping into my authenticity more. and it's enabled me to overcome all the things that I was talking about earlier about finding that joy again. So it's mm. been, yeah. So I actually feel very spiritually connected at the moment. And then weirdly, when I went to, uh, I walked into a bookstore the other day, I, there was a book about medieval witches next to my book. And I was like, that's too weird. <laughs> that is amazing. I love that. But, yeah. We've interviewed um, Emma on here. Cause uh, we, we're about oh my God. Of- yeah oh my god I love her so much she literally lives down the road for me she's like one of the greatest people ever more synergy more synergy exactly that's yeah. what it's about okay <laughs> we I love it Emma just said we love weird Josh guys I know you might not be like I'm not gonna buy the book because he thinks he's a medieval witch but <laughs> no I think you sold the book very very well like you say it's all about it's all about that deeper connection that we're all kind of like craving and um it's what we're all about here so thank you so much thank you for being here thank you for the book I'm so glad this happened yeah. and we got to hang out honestly I'm so glad I got to hang out with you and see everyone else and thank you so much for coming guys and for listening and I really hope you love the book and if you love it send me a message I know someone asked in here if it's available in the US if not available in the US yet mm-hmm. dot 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 so I might have some more information on that soon let's manifest that it's let's happening. manifest that we will okay yeah. <laughs> thank you so much Josh and thank you everybody for being here um, next week we'll be talking about the Celestine Prophecy so I will see you online for that take care everybody yeah. thank you guys bye bye bye